Hi guys, I'm Shantae Wordle, and today I will be presenting uh, my historical figure, which was Mary Winton Culkin. And I thought I would start off by uh, a brief quote that I thought very well embodied uh, Mary. Um, it states that the student trained to reach decisions in the light of logic and of history will be disposed to recognize that a distinction based on sex is artificial and illogical. First, diving into her biography and her childhood, Mary was born on March 30th in 1863 in Hartford, Connecticut to Walcott and Charlotte Culkins. She spent a majority of her life in Buffalo, New York, although her and her family did move around a lot due to her father's job of being a minister. Continuing on to her education, which was very important to her, she attended high school in Newton, Massachusetts. She attended Smith College in 1882, which was also in Massachusetts, and she studied uh, philosophy and classics. She however took a break from school in 1883 due to the death of a sister, but returned to college in 1884 and graduated in 1885 with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. She then traveled in Europe for a few years, learning Greek. Now moving on to her professional life and research, um, after her brief stint in Europe, she returned to the U.S. in 1887, where Wesley College offered her a job teaching Greek. She ended up working there for 40 years. She taught Greek, metaphysics, and psychology. She worked with a man named Hugo Musterberg at a lab in Harvard, where she was working on her dream research and working on attaining her Ph.D. And in July of 1892, she published her first paper in an issue of Philosophical Review, and she became an associate professor of philosophy and psychology at Wesley College. Over her 42-year-long career, um, Mary contributed a lot to Wesley College, and one of those was building a laboratory there, and she became the first woman to do so in the country. Um, even though she was teaching and conducting research, she was still writing, and she wrote various papers, articles, and books, and some of her most famous works include An Introduction to Psychology, which she published in 1901, The Persistent Problem of Philosophy, published in 1907, a first book in psychology published in 1909, and The Good Man and the Good published in 1918. Another very, very huge accomplishment, especially for a woman during this time, was Mary became the first president of the American Philosophical Society in 1905, and she also became the first female president of the American Psychological Association in 1918. She received honorary degrees from Smith College and Columbia University, she also received an honorary membership to the British Psychology Society in 1927. She did a lot of work at Harvard, especially uh, with her colleague Hugo, as I mentioned uh, before. However, her meeting all the criteria, Harvard never awarded her with her PhD. So moving on to the end of her life, um, she became an advocate for women's equalities and often fought for women's rights. She, however, never was married and never had children, and she passed away from cancer on February 26, 1930, at the age of 67. Moving on to the work and the research that she did during her uh, career, she focused very heavily on her memory study, which was focused on association. So the procedure of this research was she presented a list of seven to 12 paired associate items being color names or three letter nonsense syllables and the response items being two or three digit numbers. So with this paired associates method, she wanted to study the impact of four characteristics of an object of consciousness that might have an effect of the readiness to which the object called some specific contents to mind. And those four characteristics were primacy, recency, frequency, and vividness. Continuing on this paired associates memory research, she found that frequency was the most influential of those characteristics. Um, she found this important because it means we have control over our imagination and we have the ability to fight harmful associations that we could make. Um, she also found uh, four effects in this study. The first of these facts being the recency effect. Um, which was kind of the idea of short-term memory, or during that time it was known as the James primary memory concept. So she found that very frequently showed up throughout her um, paired associates memory. So another fact that she had seen um, in this experiment was the modality effect. 
And what that meant was in her second set of the studies, she used um, auditory presentation of the stimuli instead of visual like the first study was. And that's where she identified that the modality effect because she found that the visual and auditory um, series seemed similar except for the influence of recency. Another large effect that she had found in this study was the negative recency effect. And so it, she described it as the ability of participants to remember certain pairs that were given to them at different times. And she had found that the last pair in the list was remembered less when it was not tested right away. So Mary described it as a result of fatigue and that participants were not paying attention to the last set as much as they were in the first. So that's why she saw that effect. Another effect that Mary saw in her research was the primacy effect. Um, she established this effect when she saw that participants showed enhanced memory for the stimuli that they saw earlier in the experiment rather than later in her series. Um, and another effect that she kind of briefly touched on but uh, didn't show it as much support in her study was the unlearning effect, um, which she chalked this up to the fact that she used lists which the same stimuli were paired with different types of response options. So um, as people, when we try to learn something and learn the pattern of it, switching her lists with different response items, she saw that effect as well. Uh, continuing her work was uh, self psychology, which she spent a majority of her time on. She's known as the founder of self psychology, and during this time, she rejected the idea of behaviorism. She fought for self psychology to be validated and recognized as a form of psychology. She wrote a whole paper on it titled Psychology as the Science of Selves, and she alleged that the self is a conscious force in the percent perspective of psychology. She was very, very passionate about this research. However, it was one of her, mo her least famous works. As I had previously stated, one of Mary's greatest accomplishments was becoming the first female president of both of the listed organizations. Um, being the first female anything is very influential because you're allowed to open the door for other females to come after you. There was also a list made in 1908 of the leading psychologists in the United States, and she was ranked 12th on that list. So moving on to the impact that her methods have today, first starting off with the paired associates method, which was one of her most famous methods, as I had previously stated. Um, yet it was criticized by some, um, one of those including psychologist G.E. Mueller, yet he used her study, refined it, and created a method titled the Treffer method which she has been using ever since, and other psychologists have used as well. Um, her paired associates method was actually included in various books and manuals, one being the Edward Titchener's student manual, Professor Klein's Psychology by Experiment, and psychology textbooks that were published by Herrnstein and Boring. Um, another one of her very lesser known research was the Dreams research, which she conducted with Hugo Munster in the lab at Harvard. Um, her original findings found that dreams have little hidden meanings and her work was actually referenced by Sigmund Freud when he dove into his dream analysis. Um, it was also recognized in a study done by Montagero and Calvareo in 2015 which ended up in the International Journal of Dream Research and they referenced Mary's work and actually found support for her findings. Uh, finally, um, her impact in self in psychology and women's suffrage. Self in psychology, as I stated previously, was very unpopular and often criticized by fellow psychologists. Um, but women's suffrage, she spoke greatly about women's rights often at events and opened doors for females after her to be successful in this field. And that is the end of my PowerPoint. And I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about one of the very first females um, in psychology. Um, I found it very interesting because I'm always excited to learn about women in the field and how they allow women like me to learn and to study things like this. So I am very, very happy to have been able to learn about Mary Witten Culkin's life. Thank you.